Welcome back to the Home Lab and I've got an interesting experiment and demonstration for you today. What I'm going to try and do is build a tone arm so I can play a 78 record with a thorn. You might be aware at the moment that LP records are making a little bit of a comeback and they've got a very rich and interesting history. I'm sure you've all heard of Edison and the work that he did. But in fact, it's really uh, Emil Berliner, who is an American German, who invented the flat record with the lateral groove carved in it. So what I thought I'd do today is see if I could repeat some of that experimentation. But more importantly, could I get an old 78 shellac record, that's this one, to play just with a thorn from our hedge, which I believe is how it perhaps all began. But just before we begin, I want to say a huge thank you again to all of you for watching and particularly to the team at PCBWay for always encouraging me to make videos. As you know, they make circuit boards and they also do CNC machining. But today, I think the project that I'm building out of bits in my lab would be particularly suited to the 3D printing services that they offer. They've got a fantastic website, so why not go and have a look at that? And I'm sure you'll get lots of ideas for projects that you'd like to do. I'm sure you're all familiar with the record, whether it's this old 78 one or the 45s or the 33 RPM records that came later. And you're probably aware that the sound wave is actually carved into the disc or pressed into it during manufacture. So it's a little picture of the actual sound wave of the music that was being recorded. And to play that back, you kind of reverse the process. You put a needle actually in the groove, a stylus, and you rotate the record and that needle vibrates. And all you need to do is amplify that sound and you can hear the recording that you made earlier. At home, uh, part of our house is surrounded by a tall hedge, which seems to grow every time I look at it. As nice as it is, it always requires regular trimming and waste removal. And during this process, I always come out with all sorts of cuts and grazes from the thorns growing on some parts of the hedge. And I have to be careful to collect all of these up. On doing this recently, I came across some really huge thorns. And this reminded me of early gramophone record players. And that's the subject, as you know, of today's video. So here's a close up of the grooves on a 33 RPM disc. For my experiment, I'm going to use an older 78 one, which is a bit more age appropriate. But the wiggles in the groove are not so clear under the microscope as they're more stretched out with the disc spinning faster than the more modern 33 RPM one. So to explain how all this worked, let's look at the old gramophone record. And those gramophones typically used a sharpened steel needle that followed the sound wave shaped groove in the record. And that vibrated from side to side. Bear that in mind because that's quite important for how we produce the sound later on. The needle was mounted on a lever and as it wiggled from side to side, the lever was longer at the top end beyond the pivot. So it created a little bit of sort of mechanical advantage there and it moved further than the needle did. The other end of that lever, so the top end, so the needle's down here, the top end of the lever tapped on a diaphragm. And so what's interesting is you've gone from the cutting in the record, which was from a longitudinal, that's a push-pull sound wave, to one that looks transverse side to side on the record. And then the lever then taps on the diaphragm and that diaphragm turns it back, or at least the lever and the diaphragm turn it back into a push-pull longitudinal wave. Finally, the air inside the horn on the record player, because there wasn't any electronics in those days that could amplify the sound electronically, would have the effect of making the sound louder. And some of them had those great big huge horns that you've seen. But as I said, I seem to remember there was a time when record players didn't just use a steel needle, but actually used a thorn from a hedge. So it's that that I'm gonna try and build and get to work today.
Amazingly, I have a more modern record player that will play 78 records. This is my much loved Dual 5000 turntable, which I bought back in the uh, 1990s when I was a teenager, and it's doing sterling service even to this day. All that's needed is a change of needle from the diamond or sapphire one that it's got to a special metal one and a speed change, and then it's a 78 RPM gramophone. Allow me to play you a couple of examples of it in use. Signal Hill, Newfoundland, Thursday morning, December the 12th, 1901. A gale of wind, a grey inimical sky, but a kite tugging frantically at about 400 feet. So I do hope you enjoyed that musical and somewhat historical interlude and I have absolutely no idea what the YouTube copyright algorithm will make of that but I'm sure we'll find out very soon. But the reason for showing it to you is if we can spin up the old 78 record at the right speed we can then use it to test our homemade Thorn pickup arm. So over the past few weeks I've given rather a lot of thought to how I might build this thing and I knew I needed something lightweight and rigid and it also needed to have a diaphragm on it and I couldn't quite think how to go about that. It was at that stage I was reminded uh, of something a sculptor once said to me. He said, if you're going to make something out of stone, pick a piece of stone that looks like the object that you want to make in the end. Our regular visits to a favourite coffee shop of Barry's yielded the answer and there's no product placement intended here. Whilst we have a coffee, the staff kindly give him tap water in a container of his choice. And this is one of them that we took home with us. Small scratches and taps on the base of the cup were perfectly amplified. So I thought I'd build the pickup and tone arm around this. I had some lengths of balsa wood and whilst not very stiff, it would be easy to work with. Firstly, I cut out two short pieces that would hold the moving needle assembly. Then I glued these together to a longer balsa bar that would act as a support for the whole structure. Only late on in this process did I realise that a pin would make an excellent fulcrum for the pickup. I used another pin's head as the striker to act upon the base of the cup. It all reminded me somewhat of the human ear in reverse. So let's have a quick look at the contraption I've built and then we'll test it on the record player. So I've got a long handle here to sort of hold the tone arm and here's our horn. Here's our pin that's going to tap on the back of it and hopefully pick up the vibrations. I don't think there's going to be very much movement. There you can see a tiny little thorn and if I pick that up the idea is that the thorn will poke in the end of this but I am going to shorten this so there's a better mechanical advantage and then we can put it on the record player and as the record player turns we want this to go from side to side and hopefully we'll hear the music coming out of our cone horn. So let's clip one thorn off. There we go and there's our thorn and we're going to poke it into our shortened uh, little lever there and give it a go on the record player. So it's going to take me a while. I've got a little bit of a hole there, but let's see if I can do this without drawing blood. Fiddly. But there we go. So I wonder if that'll work. So, um, 
if you can hear me, the, I haven't got the microphone clipped to me. A uh, bit of messing around and trying to line it up and I was holding my breath whilst holding it tightly by the record player. But I think that actually worked. Should we give it a go with a steel needle and see what happens? As I'm sure you can see, using thorn needles was not that effective or repeatable. So fairly early on, steel needles became the norm. So let's have a go with a real gramophone's steel needle. Just for interest's sake, I've got some original metal needles here and I'll just pull one out so you can see it. So there is the very fine tip of the steel needle that would have been used in a gramophone. And they came in all sorts of different packaging. I remember some lovely little metal tins, but I haven't got one of those. But here's a, a paper top hat full of needles, or at least uh, not full, but some of them are in and some of them have gone. They've gone very, very rusty. But there's an example of another one. And that's how you'd buy them. But I do remember seeing them in little metal like uh, pill containers and they were full of about 100 metal needles. So what we can do is take one of these metal needles and put it into our tone arm and we'll give that a go as well and see if it's any better than the thorn. So I've put a steel needle in it now from the old uh, gramophone metal needles and let's put that on the record and see how we get on. Well, I think you'll agree um, that's a slightly better. It's probably a better fit to the groove. But if you're stuck for steel needles, a thorn one from the hedge will do. Just before we finish, I thought I'd try the really massive one I got from my hedge. And it was this uh, thorn that made me think about making this video in the first place. So I'll cut that off and let's give that one final go. So this thorn is a bit of a monster. We'll put it in here. Now, I'm aware now all the sort of mechanical advantage and lengths are wrong, but it doesn't matter. Let's uh, give it a go and see how we get on. As these steel needles became worn, or perhaps just to encourage sales, it was recommended that the needle was changed every one to ten plays. But I thought I'd show you an interesting way around this. The Point Master Needle Sharpener. You could put a used needle into a jig and slide it up and down a bit of emery paper and put a point back on the needle you'd just used. I'm not sure, however, how good it would be at putting a better point on a thorn needle. Just before we end, I thought I'd say that I actually really loved getting out those old 78s and playing those foxtrots from a bygone era so much that I thought I'd buy a CD with similar music on it. And then I realised that it was the sound of the scratches, the image of the fast rotating disc and the rapid changes of record that are needed to make it so wonderfully atmospheric. Sometimes the whole experience is what counts, and I guess in this case it could not be more true. Do young people today miss out on all of that by having none of this hands-on analogue experience of music? I believe they're greatly missing out. Well, at least Barry is not going to be one of those children. So I do hope you enjoyed that video. I had great fun making the item and I've really enjoyed sharing it with you as well. Anyway, do stay to the end of the video because as you know, after I finished, I often cut in some bits that didn't make it into the main video. And there's also right at the end, some links that I do hope you'll find interesting and there are two other videos that I've made. Anyway, whatever happens, I'll be making another video soon. So do please join me then. Signal Hill, Newfoundland, Thursday morning, December the 12th, 1901. A gale of wind, a grey inimical sky.
was a kite tugging frantically at about 400 feet. All was in order. They paused and listened. The pen pauses too. Thought leaps beyond it. This little group of optimists at their lonely vigil. A comrade instructed categorically, patient too, sitting at his lonely post in Cornwall, separated from them by 1,700 miles of watery wilderness, doing as he was told. Just that and no more. Sending the letter S in interminable series at prearranged times into the void. Seeing little himself, hearing nothing whatever. And the man to whom it meant so much, whose years of unremitting work had brought him to this grim day and this hour. What of him? He sits eager, expectant at a telephone, connected to a self-resisting coherer, not entirely trusting the receiving apparatus. And time moves on. Nothing, except the derisive scream of the wind. 12.30 noon. What was that? A little click. Several. Regularly. The letter S. And again, Marconi heard them for some time before he trusted himself to hand the telephone to Kemp for corroboration. Could he hear anything? Yes, he could. Then the faint sound ceased significantly. Orders were being obeyed on the other side. The listener's heart thumped with excitement. Then again, at 1.10 and at 1.20, came realism in a succession of those little staccato clicks, unmistakable, heard by them all. The tremendous expanse of ocean had been bridged. What must have been his feelings at this supreme moment? The achievement constituted an epoch in human history. The lives of millions, of every race and creed, would be affected as from this hour. The commercial possibilities were incalculable. The mitigation of loneliness was certain. Continents would speak with each other of their several aspirations. A ship in distress in the perilous wastes of the seas could be suffered. Lovers, separated by a hemisphere, would confer privily and be comforted. Empire builders, isolated in desert and jungle, would hear the sounds of their cities and be cheered and refreshed. A new world would be born. The foregoing is an extract from the book A City of Sound, recently published by the Marconi Phone Company. If you will send us the name and address of a friend who you think would appreciate the fine qualities of a Marconi phone and to whom we may mention your name as a recommendation, we will gladly send you free of charge a copy of this interesting book. An address and reply paid postcard is provided with this record. If you are pleased with the reproduction of this instrument, give us the opportunity of demonstrating to one of your friends.